Father, we just come in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you for the wonderful anointing you gave us in the first session this evening. And Lord, we ask you, O oh God, to be with us again tonight. We need you. More so tonight, Father, than today. And Father, we ask you to cause every eye to be a seeing eye, every ear to be a hearing ear. Lord, show us the greatness of our salvation. We thank you for Jesus. We thank you for what he's prepared for us. And Father, we bind every demon spirit. We bind every principality of hell. We bind every hindering spirit. We bind every religious spirit. And Father, for us here clearly, we ask for the unction of the Holy Spirit. And we thank you in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. Let's go back where we left off this morning. We're in the 22nd chapter of the book of Revelation. And I want to remind you again that Revelation 22 is a continuation of the vision that began um, in chapter number 20. But this, this uh, 22nd chapter is a continuation of the 21st chapter where the Lord showed us a new heaven and a new earth. And we're seeing that word new heaven and new earth is the word rejuvenated or regenerated. Amen. And just like when the Lord destroyed the world the first time and everything in the world was nice and holy and clean, you might say it was new in a sense because it was regenerated. Uh, God had restored life here. That's the same thing that we're about to look at again. Amen. And so he sees here those of us that are redeemed. He sees the fullness of what the 8th chapter of Romans talks about, the manifestation of the sons of God. The 21st chapter and the 22nd chapter is about the final culmination of all things. And don't forget this book of Revelation contains in it all other 65 books of the Bible. I'm telling you right now, you that's gone through this course, you are much further ahead than anybody else in this church that haven't taken this course. Are you listening to me? There is not one book of the Bible you'll be able to read but not, without knowing that it pours into the final book of the Bible, the book of Revelation. Amen? For example, from now on when you read about the rivers, you'll know that, that it's talking about the river of life that flows from the throne of Jesus. Amen? Amen. The, you can never run from it again. It can never be cut out of your mind again because you know what it's about. Amen? Let's go back where we left off this morning. We were looking very clearly. John makes a statement to us and he says... In Revelation 22, the first three verses, let's take those verses again. John speaks, and remember, he's, he's talking to us concerning what he saw in the new heaven and the new earth, he says, and he showed me a river of the water of life. Everybody said the water of life. So we've heard about the water of life all through the Bible, amen? And don't forget what John told us. John that was given this book said to us, he said, everything I saw, I confirmed it by the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. And all John had was the Old Testament. Never forget that. There's not one thing in this book that John saw that's not found in the Old Testament or in the testimony of Jesus Christ. When you begin to interpret this book, you don't do it by commentaries. Uh, you do it by the word of God. Amen? You let the word interpret the word. That's the best way to get the final understanding of what God is saying to us. So we begin to see here in describing this river, he said it's clear as crystal. It's coming from the throne of God and of the Lamb. He says in verse 2, in the middle of its street, its, uh, its street, he's talking about here the street, that narrow street, the street of gold that's in the new Jerusalem, amen, or the new earth. In its street, he says, on either side of the river was the tree of life. We know we saw this tree of life also in the book of Genesis. Remember that? In fact, when the Lord put out Adam and Eve when they had fallen, the Bible says that he put there and assigned to the entrance of that paradise an angel with a flaming sword that turned every way to guard the tree of life. What God was doing here, he was providing protection for man. He was really protecting man because if Adam and Eve had eaten from the tree of life in their fallen state, they would have lived forever in the state of sin. Are you listening to me? But now that we've come to salvation, every time we go to the Lord in prayer, he gives us to eat from the tree of life. Amen? So we see here, he says, this tree of life was bearing 12 kinds of fruit. Now, I, I told you this morning, the Hoish Harlot churches have told their people that this is for the future when we get to heaven. But we know it's impossible that it's for the future because of what John says to us concerning this tree. He says very clearly, it yields its fruit every month, and the leaves of the tree were for the what of the nations? Yes. Let me ask you a question. Are there any sickness or disease in heaven? Yes. 
So obviously this cannot be for those that's in heaven. Because when we're in heaven, we are perfect. We are sealed in perfection. We are completed. We're in the character and the nature of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's obvious. Amen. Every time you go to the Lord in prayer, you go before his throne. And every time you give to the Father a need, it's from the tree of life. It's from this river that the Lord answers to us. Is that right? Every time you seek the face of the Lord Jesus, he either takes something out of you or he'll put something in you or he'll add something to you or he'll change something or he will correct something. This is why we have to continue to live a life of continuous prayer. Can you say amen to that? Amen. And that's probably one of the greatest things that the church today is totally deficient in. People that will pray or people that know how to pray. And the Bible says very clearly in Hebrews 2 verse 3, how can you escape the judgment of God if you continue to, to neglect so great a salvation? So, when you begin to go before the Lamb of God, you are literally causing him or permitting him to change our character and our nature into the image of the Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible says that we are God's workmanship. Now, don't forget what we saw last night in the two sessions. Every jewel that we saw, listen, in the 21st chapter of the book of Revelation, are the very same jewels that was worn by the high priest in the book of Exodus. Remember that? We also saw that Satan once had those jewels. And we also saw that Satan hates the ground we walk on because we are replacing him. And this is why he attacks us with everything he can attack us with. This is why he tries to discourage us to turn back. Because Satan is reminded every time he sees a believer of the place from which he had fallen, and he's reminded that every believer that continues until the end will have what he, he once had. I want you to think about that. So we see here that the Lord has provided for us total healing, total deliverance. Every need is met from this tree. Every need is met from this river. And we saw very clearly just today in the first session that this river is shown and talked about all through the word of God. Did we not see that, church? Now notice something else he says there about coming before the throne of God. In verse 3, John gives us testimony concerning the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ coming into his presence before this river. And some of us are like Naaman. We're spiritual lepers. And we have to keep coming to this river. We have to keep being dipped into this river until we're clean and set free from every sin habit, every bondage, every disease. Or you listening to me. It's in this river. It's from this tree that every need that we have need of in our Christian walk with God is provided. And so John says in verse 3, And there shall be, there shall no longer be any curse. Think about it. Every time you go before God, before the throne, let's say that you are cursed. That curse will not live there. It will die. Curses cannot live in the presence of God. Curses cannot live before the throne of God. Sin habits cannot live before the throne of God. Are you listening to me? And so it's at this river that we eat. It's at this river that we drink. It's at this river that we bathe. It's at this river that we're continuously kept clean. We're continuously made clean at this river. Every time God shows you a defect in your character, maybe it's anger, maybe it's lust, maybe it's pride, maybe it's greed, maybe it's unforgiveness, and you go before God, you say, Father, I see within me, Lord, an area of darkness. Lord, an area where I'm helpless. Help me. It's from these trees that we're given to eat. Are you hearing me? It's from this river that we're washed and made clean. It's because of this river we're changed in the character and the nature of the Lord Jesus Christ. So John says, there shall no longer be any curse and the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it and his bondservants shall serve him. Do you say that? Now we saw very clearly that the only way that you can understand the book of Revelation is from the word of God and the word of God that John had was the Old Testament. And if you remember that when we left off this, uh, this evening, we were in the 58th chapter of the book of Isaiah. Let's go back there, please. Isaiah chapter 58. And we were in the midst of looking at the actions of those of the river. These are the actions of the trees of God. And the Bible calls us those trees. The Bible says the trees of the field would clap their hand. Is that right? 
And we're told that we're supposed to be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth our fruit in due season and our leaves are not supposed to weather. And the only way that the leaves in our lives don't wither, the only way that we can continue to bring forth the fruit of God is that we continue to stay before this river and to drink of this river. Amen? And so we're looking at the life or the actions of those that are led by the river and they live by the river. Amen? Isaiah chapter 58. Let's go back there, please. Tell you what, let's just begin where we left off because we begin to look first in the book of Proverbs. Let's go first to the book of Proverbs, then Isaiah. Let's just tie these two messages together. And before I go any further, I want to say to you, especially for those that are hearing the tape in different parts of the world, um, if you want to get some good commentaries about the book of Revelation, there's only two people I can recommend. I'm not going to recommend to you uh, Jonathan Edwards because he didn't have as much illumination as Lord has blessed us with. But I do have his book and anyone want to borrow it. But let me show you, here's where you can write. You can write Grace Abounding Ministries, Post Office Box 25, Sterling, Virginia. And the zip code there is 22170. And so for you that's taking notes in the class, if you didn't hear what I said, I'll give you this information after the class. If you want to, if you want to phone there, the area code is 703-450-4121. And for our class, we're using, in this Bible class, we're using the three books by Philip Morrow. One's called The Gospel of the Kingdom. One's called The Seventy Weeks and the Great Tribulation. I would recommend both of those books very highly. They're perfect. And the book of Revelation that we're recommending is the things which he's written, things which soon must come to pass. This is commentary on the book of Revelation. The other book that we're using in this class is by a man by the name of William Hendrickson called More Than Conquerors. And William Hendrickson is considered today one of the best uh, commentators in the world today. So those books will help you to understand the great symbolism and the richness of this book of the revelation of Jesus Christ. And everything about this book is concerning Jesus. Can you say amen to that? Amen. In Proverbs 11, 25, let's look there again, please. Now these are the actions of those that are being uh, washed in the river, bathed in the river, they're eating from the river, and they're living by the river. Proverbs 11, verse 25. Now, don't forget, we've already saw in the first session this evening that the Lord said, I go to prepare a place for you. Jeremiah told us that the place that God prepared for us was before the throne, which was a place of residency while we on this earth at the river of life. Amen? Amen. So in Proverbs 11 chapter, notice with me, please, verse 25. Proverbs 11, verse 25. The generous man, that means the soul of blessing. The man that has a soul that is of blessings. The generous man, the, or the soul of blessing will be prosperous or made fat. And he who waters will himself what? Be watered. In other words, every time you go out, or uh, maybe you're in your job or you're in the grocery market, and you begin to drop on someone the word of God or the, or the river of life, God gives to you more water. If you want to uh, cause a, a great uh, redeeming of the time, you can begin to do it by, by uh, winning souls, witnessing to others concerning Jesus, laying your life down, for others. Amen? Then he says in the next verse, he who withholds grain, the grain is the word of God. God says, the people will curse him. But blessing will be on the head of him who sell it. Every time you speak the word of God, you're selling the word of God. And the only way the word of God can be purchased is not with money, but it's purchased by those that hear the word and they accept the word. Are you hearing me? So we're looking here at the actions of those whose life is attached to the river. Look at Isaiah 58 again, please. We left off there today when time ran out on us. Isaiah 58. Let's begin again at the sixth verse. Because these are the actions of those whose life is attached to the river that flows from the throne. And God says in the sixth verse, is this not the fast which I choose? To loosen the bands of wickedness, to undo the bands of the yoke, and to let the oppressed go free, and to break every yoke. There's not one area of bondage that God wants to continue in our lives. Is it not to divide your bread with who? The hungry. The Lord said, he that hungers and thirsts after righteousness shall be filled. The bread here is the bread of life. He's not talking about hamburgers. Or bologna sandwiches. He's talking here about the word of God. Jesus said, I'm the living bread that's come out of heaven. Amen? Amen? 
He's easy not to divide your bread with the hungry and to bring the homeless poor into the house, not into your house, into the house. Christ is the house. Amen? He said, when you see the naked, he told you in Revelation 3 that there are many that say, I'm rich and I'm increased with goods. I have need of nothing. He said, you don't know that you're blind and poor and miserable and naked. He's talking here about those of us that are spiritually naked. When we saw the jewels listed in the 21st chapter, we were looking at our clothes, the clothes of the priest. We've already seen very clearly. He said, those that were clothed in the white garments, they were the righteous acts of the saints. And we saw from the book of Revelation, they were linen garments. And only the priests wear linen garments. And the Bible says that when Jesus died for us, he made us kings and priests through his blood. Amen? Amen. So you, you, you cover their nakedness with the robes of righteousness. And he says, you not to hide yourself from your own flesh. Every human being on the face of the earth is flesh. And we're all one because of flesh. Amen? Here's what God said will happen to your life. He says, then your light will break out like the dawn. And your recovery will, what's that next word? Speedily. Did I not say you could redeem the time? Speedily spring forth. Do you see that? And your righteousness will go before you. And the glory of the Lord will be your real God. Then you'll call. And the Lord will answer. He, you will cry. And he'll say, here I am. God says, if you remove the yoke from your midst, the pointing of the finger and speaking wickedness, and if you give yourself to the hungry, these are those that are hungry and thirsting after righteousness, and you satisfy the desire of the afflicted, every afflicted person wants to be set free. Is that right? Every person that's burdened today wants their yokes broken. They want answers. They want to know the reality of what it means to be free. Is that right? And you and I have been entrusted by God with the answer. He told us in 2 Corinthians 5, 17. He said, if any man is in Christ, is a new creature. The old things have passed away. All things become new. And God has reconciled us to himself through Christ Jesus. And he, God, has given to each and every one of us the ministry of reconciliation. Is that right? If we're not telling others about Jesus, we are not walking in the path or the road that God's called us into. And he goes on and he says, he says, then your light will rise in darkness and your gloom will become like midday. Think about it. The worst day in your life is like the brightness of the sun shining in its greatest strength. That means you don't have a, a lifestyle of depression or being down or in the muddy grub. Is that right? He says your gloom will be like the midday. Well, if your gloom is like midday, when you're having a great time, what it can be compared to? Think about that. He says, and the Lord will continually guide you. He will satisfy your desire in scorched places. He will give strength to your bones. And you will be like a what kind of garden? Watered garden. You are watered from the river of life. There it is again. And like a spring of water whose waters do not fail. Can you imagine living in a place where you're always fed by the river that flows from the throne of God. That's what he's saying. He says, and those from among you will rebuild the ancient ruins. If you don't know it, the house of God, they are in ruins. Holiness has been totally cut out. Fasting and prayer has been substituted for covered dish dinners. Are you listening to me? Look what he says. You will raise up the age-old foundation. We know that the foundations is Jesus Christ, the chief cornerstone, and also the ministry of the Old Testament, of the, of the Old Testament prophets, and the ministry of the New Testament, and of the New Testament apostles. Is that right? And you will be called. That means you will have a, a character change. You won't be selfish anymore. You won't be living for self anymore. But this becomes part of your character, your nature. God says, and you shall be called. The repairer of the breach. Who do you think is calling you that? God's calling you that. Just like the, God, the Lord changed uh, by Jonah, Simon by Jonah, who was, who was God named him Peter. His name was not Peter. His name was Simon by Jonah. The word Simon means one that's carried along in the, any breeze, any wind, any demon power will come along and lead Peter's life astray. But God changed his name to Peter or Petros, which means little stone. 
which means he became a rock. He was solid. He wasn't movable again by demon powers. He wasn't shaken anymore. God says, I'm going to call you the repairer of the breach. The repairer of the breach is also a peacemaker. The repair of the breach is also one that causes healing. The repair of the breach is one that causes deliverance. The repair of the breach is one that causes salvation to come. The repair of the breach is a mediator that brings others to the Lord. And he says, the restorer of the streets in which to dwell. A better translation in the Hebrew, the word streets there is the word paths. You see, the narrow way is called a path. You know why it's called a path? Because not many travel on it very much. Now listen to me. Let's go one more place, please. We also saw this morning, or this evening, when the time was running out, the song of Solomon, that the bride that God's going to marry is a watered bride. Is that right? So let's go back to the song of Solomon. The song of Solomon is after the book of uh, Ecclesiastes. And Ecclesiastes after the book of Proverbs. And Proverbs after the book of Psalms. Amen? So let's go to the song of Solomon. And let's look again at the fourth chapter. And let's look at the tenth verse. And the Lord God is speaking. And he says, How beautiful is your love. And he talks about us as if we are kin. And we are because of his blood. The Bible says Jesus is the firstborn among many brethren. Is that right? We know that in God there's neither male nor female. Jew nor Greek, bond or free. We're all one in Christ Jesus. Is that right? So sometime we're called, he says, to as many as received him, gave him to them power to become sons of God. If women receive Jesus, they be called sons of God. Is that right? Also, he said that we're the bride of Christ. A bride is a female. So sex, with God's eyes, is totally inexchangeable. He's not looking at sex. He's not looking at color. He's looking at the heart. Is that right? So here he, he talks about us as being blood kin. And he says here, I've left my place, the, the tenth verse. How beautiful is your love. Here's the can. My sister. Then he says, my bride. How much better is your love than wine and the fragrance of your oils than all kinds of spices. Your lips, my bride, drip honey. Honey and milk are under your tongue. Honey is also a type of, and shadow of the word of God. Milk is stability. No backsliding. And the fragrance of your garments is like the fragrance of Lebanon. Lebanon means strength. That means everything about your life, your character, your countenance. It's the strength of God. And the joy of the Lord is our strength. Is that right? Lebanon was known for their trees. Or we call the trees of the field. Then look what he says about his bride. You see, a garden that's been locked, nobody can get into that garden and steal it. Amen? They can't pilfer from that garden. It's protected. Don't forget what we saw in the 21st chapter. He says there's going to be a wall around you. Amen? He says a garden locked. A spring sealed up. Think about it. Your shoots are an orchid of pomegranates with choice fruit, henna with nard plants, nard and saffron, calamus and cinnamon with the trees of frankincense, myrrh and aloes along with all the finest Finest spices. Why does she have all those finest spices? Because you're looking at what your salvation looks like. It's God's workmanship. Amen? It's God's engraving upon you. It's God's seals upon you. And don't forget what we saw. The pearls, all the gems, all the jewels. Every time you go to him and say, Lord, here's a defect in my life. He says, angel, go down there, cut it out. And then he replaces it with his character. He calls them jewels. Amen? Look what he says. In verse 15, he says, you are a garden spring, a well of fresh water and streams flowing from Lebanon. Can you say amen? amen? Let me show you this watering from God. This is where we left off. Go to Ezekiel 36. Ezekiel chapter 36. Notice with me verse 22. Ezekiel 36 verse 22. How great is our salvation. Can you say amen to that? Amen. Ezekiel 30 36 verse 22. And you're going to see here that when the Lord forgives our sins, he not only forgives our sins, he purges from us our sins. He purges from us every defect, 
every flaw in our character and our nature. Don't forget when you got saved, you weren't complete yet. Salvation is not a one-time experience. It's a lifestyle that we live every day. Is that right? Yes. Look what he says here. In the 22nd verse, the Lord speaks here to this prophet. He says, therefore, say to the house of Israel. Now, wh what do we learn that Israel means? The people of God. That's all it means. You don't worship natural Israel anymore. Amen? Amen. Paul warned us about that. He said, therefore, say to the house of Israel, thus says the Lord God, it is not for your sake, O house of Israel, that I'm about to act, but for, for my holy name, which you have profaned among the nations where you went. The way you profane God's name, you claim to be a Christian, and you go out in the world, and you don't act any different in the world. Amen? Verse 23, God says, And I will vindicate the holiness of my great name, which has been profaned among the nations, which you have profaned in their midst. Then the nations will know that I am the Lord, declares the Lord God, when I prove myself holy among you in their sight. God, how are you going to do it? He tells you in verse 24. He says, for I will take you from the nations. The word nations with an S means what? Demon powers or places of the enemy. Because we are a people of God, not peoples with an S. We are a peculiar people. Amen? He says, I will take you from the nations, gather you from all the lands. Again, it's with an S. Not singular, but then he talks about the, the single place. And I will bring you into where? Your own land. What's our own land? The place where the presence of God dwells. Amen? Satan is not afraid of me. He's not afraid of you, but he's afraid of the presence of God. Is that right? And the presence of God only comes where there's a holy life. Then he says, verse 25, here's that, that spring of water again that we saw. Then I will sprinkle, he says, clean water on you, and you will be what? Clean. You see, every time you go to the river, oh God, I'm so sorry for my sins. Here's a flaw in my character. Lord, there's pride here. Lord, cut it out. Cleanse me from it. He sprinkles clean water on you. You see what he's saying to us? He says, I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you will be clean. I will cleanse you, he says, from all your filthiness and from all your idols. Let me make a statement. It's wonderful to know the Word of God. But just knowing the Word of God is of absolutely no benefit to you unless God changes your heart. And God will not change your heart unless you continue to cry out to Him, even as David did, saying, Lord, give me a new heart. You can know this whole Bible. The Pharisees memorized the first five books of the Bible, and they all went to hell. They were in church every time the door opened. So were the Sadducees. So are all the scribes. Knowing the Bible doesn't mean a hill of beans unless you're saying, Lord, here's what your word says. Lord, I'm your workmanship. Do this work in me. I can't change my heart. I can't change my character. I can't stop sinning. Change me, Father. Give me a new character. Give me a new nature. That's what God's talking about in the next verse. He says in verse 26, moreover, I will give you what? A new heart. I will put a what in you? a new spirit within you, and I, God says, will remove the heart of stone from your flesh. If you and I are still walking in sin, it's because there's a place of stone still in our chest. It's a heart problem. The, the, the powers of darkness that you can't break in your life is because it's a heart problem. You can't stop gossiping and slandering. It's a heart problem. You can't stop lusting and getting angry. It's a heart problem. You go to God and say, God, my heart is still a heart of stone. There's a heartness there. There is not a heart, oh God, that's surrendering to you. Lord, give me a new heart. And you continue to cry out. And God will give you a new heart. Lord, my spirit is not of your spirit. Lord, I can't stand holiness. Lord, I find that in my life, that Lord, that I'm, I'm identified more with sin and evil practices than I am with holiness. There's no hatred of sin. Lord, give me a new spirit. You ask him for it. He said, you have not because you ask not. Amen. 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 Look what he says here. He says, I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of what? Flesh. Why does he say stone and flesh? We know that flesh and blood can't enter heaven. This, this is all symbolic. When he talks about a heart of flesh, he's talking about a heart that's soft, pliable. He can touch. You can hear him. You can respond. You can react to God's spirit. 
sensitive, touchable, reachable, not dull of hearing, not a heart that loves sin anymore, not a heart that identifies with sin anymore, but a heart that lives only for the Spirit of God, a heart that lives for holiness. God said, I'm going to do this. I'm going to prove myself holy among the nations. I'm going to take you, he says, out from the other enemy. I'm going to give you a new heart. I'm going to give you a new spirit. It's all done to the river before the throne. And he says in verse 27, And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes, and you will be careful to observe my ordinances. When does that happen? He gives a new heart, a new spirit, it was my part to continue to cry and ask for it, to continue to reach for it. Amen? And you will live in the land, singular, that I gave to your forefathers. So you will be my people and I will be your God. Don't forget what you saw. God only says that he's, that he's our God and that we're his people when we have come out from those and become separate and we're not touching anything that's unclean. Is that right? Moreover, he says, I will save you from all your uncleanliness. Isn't that wonderful to know? You see, it's wonderful to know that I can't change myself, but it's even greater to know that God will change me if I ask him to. Amen? Amen? He said, I will save you from all your uncleanliness, and I will call for the grain and multiply it, and I will not bring a what on you? I will not bring a famine on you. Now, we're going to see about that famine. Because wherever there's a famine, that's where the, 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 the water from the throne of God is totally cut off. Oh, you're listening to me. So remember that. He says, I will not, he says, send a famine on you, and I will multiply the fruit of the tree and the produce of the field, that you may not receive again the disgrace of famine among the nations. What's going to happen? Until you reach the place where you totally despise and hate sin, God will not move. Begin to ask him. Say, Lord, cause me to hate sin. Cause me to love holiness. Look what he says in the next verse. He says in verse 31, Then you will remember your evil ways and your deeds which were not good. Folks, he's talking about since you became a Christian. And you will loathe who? Yourself. When you start loathing yourself, do you continue to live for self? No. You begin to die to self, don't you? He said, you will loathe yourself in your own sight for your iniquities and your abominations. Again, he reminds you of something, verse 32. He says, I'm not doing this for your sake, declares the Lord God. To be known to you, be ashamed and confounded for your ways, O house of Israel. Thus says the Lord God, on the day that I cleanse you from all your iniquities, I will cause the cities to be inhabited and the waste places shall be rebuilt. And the desolate land will be cultivated instead of being a desolation in the sight of everyone who passes by. Who do you think he's talking about? Who's the desolate land? We are. And then he says, and don't miss this. What an awesome statement from God. What an awesome promise. It might be good to start praying these promises to God. And here's what everybody that passed by your life is going to say. Verse 35, and they will say, this desolate land has become like the Garden of Eden and the waste desolate and ruined cities are fortified, which means surrounded with God's protection and inhabited. Then the nations that are left around about you will know that I, the Lord, have rebuilt the ruined places and planted that which was desolate. I, the Lord, have spoken and will what? I will do it. And the Bible says God watches over his word to perform it. Is that right? I want you to go to Psalm 72, please. Because God describes this river sometimes as a personality, as himself. In Psalm 72, notice with me two verses, verse 6 and verse 7. Psalm 72, verse 6 and verse 7. Here we see, talking about the Lord Jesus, and this is the, the psalm that describes the prophecy of the reign of Jesus Christ. The Holy Hall of Church keeps telling their people, that Jesus is going to reign way off in the future in something they call the millennium. We've already discovered that the thousand years represent what? Okay. One day and it's a day of what? Salvation. Okay. Amen? And so this whole psalm tells us what's going to happen when the Lord Jesus Christ ascends to the throne. He begins to reign and rule. And so we see here these two verses. 
It says, may he come down like what? Rain upon the what? Mowed grass. When God talks about grass, what is grass a symbol of? Flesh. He tells you very clearly in Isaiah 42, 6, that all flesh is grass. So when you start mowing down your flesh, breaking the power of your flesh, what does Jesus do? He comes down where the flesh is being crucified. We read that in Galatians 5, 24. They that are Christ have crucified the flesh with his lust and passions thereof. Is that right? Let's continue. May he come down like rain upon the mowed grass, like showers that do what? There's that water again, that water the earth. In his days, may the righteous flourish. That means be made fruitful. An abundance of peace to the moon is what? Unto the moon is no more. Do you see that? One more place, please. Go to Hosea, the sixth chapter. Again, we see this water. Hosea chapter 6. You ready? The Lord is bringing us back to holiness. As Pastor Holmes has so eloquently stated this evening. He's bringing us back to our first love. He talked about how that when he first got saved, he was so turned on, he witnessed to everything that moved. That was my testimony too. We lost it. But all of a sudden, he's bringing us back to it, isn't he? Bringing us back to that place where we loved, loved, just loved, and just loved. Loved him and loved his people and just loved and loved, right? Hosea 6 says, come, let us return to the Lord. How can you return somewhere unless you begin there, then left and went off? He told you in Isaiah 53, all of us like sheep have gone astray. Each of us have turned to our own way. But the Lord has caused the iniquity of us all to rest upon him. Is that right? He says, come, let's return to the Lord. Why have we gone through such a rough time? He tells you, for he, God, has what? Torn us. But he will what? Heal us. He has what? Wounded us. But he will what? Bandage us. Look at verse 2. He will revive us after two days. And he will raise us up on the what? Third day. What is he talking about? Jesus died. He was in the grave for how long? Three days. And then he was what? Resurrected. God is saying after a time, I'll listen to you for a time. Repent. I'll let you repent for a season. I'll listen to you. I'll watch you. I'll see if you mean business. But your day of resurrection will come. Your third day will come. You see what to you? Then what will he do to us? He says, he will raise us up on the third day that we may live before him. So, let us know. Let us press on to know the Lord. There's a word press. The word prosperity means cleaving through and pressing through to righteousness. Let us press on, in other words, to prosperity or success with God. Let us not quit. Let us not give up. Let us not turn back. Look what he says. He says, his going forth is as certain as the dawn, and he will come to us like what? The rain. The rain. Like the spring rain, what will he do? Watering the earth. Folks, who's the earth? We are. Are we made from the dust of the earth? We're the earth. Earthy. Amen? Meditating on God's word brings us to the river. Here's what happens. You walk in this world. He already told us. The whole world lies in the power of the wicked one. Is that right? When you and I walk through this world, every day we're walking through herds of demons. Herds of devils. And they're talking to us. You'll never overcome. You're nothing. God hasn't forgiven you. He don't love you. If he loved you, he'd bless you more. How come you're not blessed? Look at brother so-and-so. Is that right? So you find yourself again, yeah, he doesn't. Well, why don't I have it? Right? But something happens. The Spirit of God begins to speak a word to you from the Word of God. You start meditating upon it. And all of a sudden, more scriptures begin to come. It becomes like a well of life springing up from your belly. Out of your innermost being, the Word begins to pour forth. Is that right? You start meditating on God. All of a sudden, because of you're meditating on God, doubt is totally destroyed. Every lie is broken. You find yourself before the throne saying, Father, help me. Is that right? Go to Psalms 1. That's what David's talking about. And when you go before the throne, guess where you went? 
before the river, before the trees that bear fruit for the healing of the nations. So I only get to this place through meditating upon the word of God. Psalms 1. <laughs> You're alive tonight, glory. What were you last night? <laughs> Psalms 1. Oh. <laughs> I was in shock too the first time God gave me this book. If I've been wearing dentures, I'd have fallen on the floor. <laughs> Psalms 1, verse 1. How blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked. Every time you listen to demon powers, you're listening to the counsel of the wicked. Any voice that speaks to you that's contrary to the word of God is a lie. Any thought that you have in your mind that's not the word of God, it's a lie. He told you in Isaiah 55, how long will your wicked thoughts lodge within you? My thoughts are not your thoughts. My ways are not your ways. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my thoughts in your thoughts and my ways in your ways. You don't think in your own thoughts. You think and meditate upon the mind of Christ. Paul says we've all been given the mind of Christ. You think the word of God. You align your thinking that with the word of God. You align your thinking that with the testimony that Jesus has given concerning us. Amen? Through Jesus. So he says, how blessed is that man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, nor stand in the path of sinners, nor sit in the seat of scoffers. Folks, if you're not on the throne with Jesus, you're in the seat of scoffers. For his delight, his delight is in the law of the Lord. If you're having problems loving the word of God, be honest with God. Tell him, say, Father, I hate your word. Father, I despise your word. Change me. Give me a love for your word. He'll change you. Amen. His delight. The problem we have in the body today, the word of God is not most people's delight. But his delight is in the law of the Lord. His law is also holiness. Amen. And in his law, what does he do? He meditates. He thinks on what the word says. That's what meditation means. It means to turn and revolve, to contemplate, to ponder, to wonder, to imagine, to chew, to turn over and over in the mind. He meditates upon the word of God. How often? Day and night. What happens to this man? He becomes transformed by his thought life. How do I know? He tells you the next verse. And he will be like a tree firmly planted. Folks, if he's firmly planted, can he be uprooted very easily? No. Can any storm or breeze come along and blow him down? No. But he'll become firmly planted. By what? There they are. There they are. By what? Streams of water. Where are those streams of water? At the throne. Amen. Look at this next part. Which yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither, and in whatever he does, he what? He presses through to righteousness. He prospers. He has success. He's not overcome by devils. Amen? He presses through to righteousness. Go one more place with me, please. Go to Jeremiah 17. Because when you start trusting God, when you start meditating on God's word, what does it do to you? It calls you to trust God. If you start meditating on what Satan gives you in your mind, your thinking, your thoughts, you begin to distrust God. You start, start trusting what the demons say to you. Jeremiah 17. Jeremiah chapter 17. Jeremiah 17. Notice with me, please, verse 7 and verse 8. Blessed is that man that trusts in the Lord and whose trust is the Lord. Let me tell you people something. I don't walk around worrying and doubt and unbelief because I can't change myself. When God shows me an area of sin in my life, I say, Father, my trust is you. You know I can't change myself. You know I wouldn't be like this if I could change myself. Father, change me. I'm trusting you. I'm entrusting this to you. I'm committing this to you. I'm casting all my cares on you. It's you that cares for me. Father, I'm your, I'm your workmanship. I can't change myself. I can't save myself. Change me. The Lord becomes his trust. Turn it over. Blessed is that man who's trust, who trusts in the Lord. And his trust is the Lord. He trusts in the Lord, and the Lord is his trust. 
for he will be like a tree planted by the river that extends its roots by a stream. He will not fear when he comes. When the demons are pressuring you, you say, that's just those stupid devils pressing me again. <laughs> but Lord, I'm by, I'm by, by your stream. Amen. You don't say, oh, the devil's attacking me again. Oh, get them off. You say, Lord, you're my trust. He does not fear when the heat comes, but his leaves will be green and it will not be anxious in a year of drought, nor cease to yield fruit. Do you see that? Go to Isaiah 55. I've quoted some from there. Look at the 10th verse. Isaiah 55, verse 10. Isaiah 55, verse 10. I've quoted verse 8 and 9 already, but let's just pick up verse 10. For as the rain and the snow come down from heaven, and does, do not return there without what? Watering the earth. Making it bare and sprout and furnishing seed to the sower and bread to the eater. Do you say that? When you start saying, Father, here's what your word says. Father, I found it right here in your word. Father, you said you watch over your word to perform it. Father, I can't change my heart. Father, you said that you would change my heart. Father, you said you put a new spirit in me, Father. Father, change my heart. Father, give me a new spirit. I'm trusting in you. My trust is in the Lord. My trust is the Lord. Are you following what I'm saying to you? We're talking about salvation. We're talking about the process of salvation. Amen? Now, I said to you earlier, there is famine where there is not this water flow from that river. Amen? Let me prove it to you. Would you please go over to Jeremiah 4? Jeremiah chapter 4, please. Look with me at verse 16 and 17. Jeremiah 4, verse 16 and 17. This us begin at verse 14. Are you ready? The Lord says here, verse 14, you wash your heart from what? Evil, O Jerusalem. You might have to keep going down to that river, folks, saying, Lord, dip me in again. There's still evil in my heart. That's how you get washed at the river. You wash your heart from evil or defilement, O Jerusalem, that you may be what? Saved. And God has a question. He says, how long will your wicked thoughts lodge within you? Folks, do you see that? Let me take you one more place. Let me just go to Joel 1 for a moment. Let me go to Joel 1. Go to Joel 1, please. Joel chapter 1. Joel 1. Look at verse 16 through 20. Joel 1, 16 through 20. You ready? Verse 16. Has not food been cut off before our what? Eyes. Gladness and joy from the house of who? Our God. The seeds shrivel under their clods. The storehouses are desolate. The barns are torn down, for the grain is what? Dried up. Do you see that? But the four Amos, here's another place where beasts don't mean demons. How the beasts groan, the herds of cattle wander aimlessly. Because there's no pasture for them, which means there's no word of God. Even the flocks of sheep suffer. To thee, O Lord, I cry, for fire has devoured the paths of the wilderness, and the flame has burned up all the trees of what? The field. Who are the trees of the field? We are, the people of God. Do you see that? There's no water there. How do I know? He tells you in verse 20. Even the brooks of the field pant for thee. For the water brooks are what? Dried up. And fire has devoured the pastures of the wilderness. Do you see that? Now you know why there's many Christians talk about they're always depressed. Go to Amos 4. I'm sure there's famine. Amos 4. Go forward to the right. Amos is the next book after Joel. Amos, the fourth chapter. Again, we see here verses 6. Amos 4, verse 6. God began to tell us what he did with our life. I'm going to say something to you. Every time you're in a dry place, every time in your life you are in a dry place, God puts you there to bring you closer to him. Every time. 
Every time you're in a dry place, he does that to you to cause you to come into a season of spending time before his throne, to seek in his face so that he can water you, so that he can change you every time. How do I know? I'll fix to read it. Amos 4, verse 6. Anybody ever had any dry places? Amen. How many answered God's invitation? Don't answer that. Amos 4, 6. God says, I did this to you, but I gave you also cleanliness of teeth in all your cities. That means everywhere you went, every church you visit, you just couldn't find nothing to eat. He said, this ain't doing nothing for me. God says, I'm doing it to you. Look what else happened. And lack of bread in all your places. This is a living bread, the word of God. He says, yet you have not returned to me, declares the Lord. And furthermore, I withheld the rain from you. And there was still three months until the harvest. In other words, you should have yielded fruit. By now, there's not that right fruit there yet. Still you won't return to him. Look what else he says. He says, I withheld the rain from you. While there was still three months until the harvest, then I would send rain on one city, and on another city I would not send rain. One part would be rained on, while the part not rained on would dry up. So two or three cities would stagger together to another city to drink water but would not be satisfied. You know how you do it? Somebody told you, child, there's a move of God in our church. And you run over there. Really? Because you want God. And you run over there. You get there and you say, what would happen? Every time I show up, the spot gets turned off. <laughs> God says, I was doing it to you. Are you seeing what's happened? Yeah. Look what else he says. And so they see the nation and say, wasn't that some service last night? And you say, yeah, I guess it was. <laughs> now, have you ever been there? I've done it. I mean, they told me, said, ooh, you ought to hear this man bring the word of God. And I come getting, getting, I used to get work, get in from work. I get quickly get dressed. I fly my car way across town. I get there. I'll be so happy just waiting. And nothing would happen. <laughs> and I'd say, Amen. I wonder why when I show up, God always seems to leave. <laughs> You've done that, haven't you? I've done it too. Look what else he says. He says, so two or three cities would stagger together to another city to drink water, would stagger to another city to drink water, but they would not be satisfied. He says, yet you have not returned to me, declares the Lord. God was saying, I love you so much that I personally want to deal in your life. I'm not going to treat you like the other people because I have a part of your heart, and I personally want to give you water to drink from my own hand. But he says, but yet you won't come to me. Then he says, I smote you with scorching wind and mildew. And the caterpillar was devouring. Your many gardens and vineyards, fig trees and olive trees. He says, yet you have not returned to me, declares the Lord. He says, I sent a plague among you after the manner of Egypt. I slew your young men by the sword, along with your captured horses. Your captured horses are symbol. Horses were a symbol like we have Mercedes Benz and uh, BMWs today, or Rolls Royce today. He said, you, you probably bought and you said, Nothing seems to go right with my car. Everything goes wrong. I wonder why this keeps happening to me. I wonder how come God's blessing is not with me. God says, I was doing it. Look what else he says. He said, I made the stench of your camp rise up in your nostrils. He said, yet you have not returned to me, declares the Lord. I overthrew you, he says, as God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah. And you were a firebrand snatched from a blaze, yet you have not returned to me, declares the Lord. Therefore, thus I will do to you, O Israel, because I shall do this to you, prepare to meet your God, O Israel, for behold, he who forms mountains and creates winds and declares to man what are his thoughts, who makes dawn into darkness and treads in the high place of the earth. The Lord of hosts is his name. Folks, do you see that? All that we've gone through, listen to me, in our Christian walk, God has been in total charge from day one. And we would not return to him. Amos 8, verse 11 to 13. Then God says in verse 11 of Amos 8, Behold, days are coming, declares the Lord God, when I'm going to send a famine on the land, not a famine for bread or a thirst for water, but rather for hearing the words of the Lord. And people will stagger from sea to sea. This is not talking about river places. Sea means sea of people. They run to this camp meeting, they run to that camp meeting. They stagger. See, when you stagger, you're not walking straight. You're drunk. That means you're drunk on the spirit of the world, you're staggering. You're drunk on the spirit of this age. Drunk on the spirit of this world. Looking for God. Wonder why I can't find God. I can't ever seem to touch God. Everybody seems to get blessed but me. He said they will stagger from sea to sea. They, from, from the north even to the east. They will go to and fro 
to seek the word of the Lord, but they will not what? They won't find it. I mean, it's all these beautiful church services. No God. And that day, the beautiful virgins and the young men will faint from thirst. The Lord said he called the young men because they were strong. Is that right? No water. They're fainting for what? Thirst. No water to drink. And get to not going to God. Look at Zechariah 9, please. Zechariah chapter 9. Just keep going right. A few books. In Zechariah 9, notice with it, verse 11 through 17. Zechariah 9, verse 11 through 17. Where there's no water, you get destroyed. Where there's no water, the demons attack you. Are you listening? Where's the water? It flows from the throne. Amen? How do you get to the throne? You go by prayer. Come boldly before the throne of grace that you may receive help. Is that right? And grace to help in time of need. But most people are too busy calling the different Christian networks, pray for me. They won't do their praying for themselves. I mean, one evangelist told me, he said, if you want your ministry to get rich, all you do is send out letters and tell the people of God to look, send me letters. I'm your servant. I am praying for you. He said, they will bless your socks off because no one wants to pray for themselves. That's why I don't send letters. <laughs> Anybody got a letter from me? You never will. <laughs> Zechariah, ninth chapter, verse 11. As for you also, don't miss this. Why did God save us? Why has God continued to put up with our filth? in our backslidden ways, and our compromise with sin, here's why. Not for our sake, but because of his son Jesus. Jesus, the Bible says in Hebrews, is the guarantee of the covenant. And it's the covenant of his blood. Is that what he said in Luke 22? He said, take this, drink this. This is the blood, my blood of the covenant, the new covenant, for you. God says in verse 11, as for you also, because of the blood of my covenant with you, I have set your prisoners free from the what kind of pit? Water. Ain't no water in that pit, folks. The waterless pit. Return to the stronghold. The stronghold is God. Amen. Return to the stronghold, O oh prisoners who have the hope. This very day I'm declaring that I will restore what? Double to you. Same thing you're reading Joel. He says, I will restore the years that the locusts, the caterpillars, the palmer worms, and the canker worms have eaten up. Did he not tell us that? Why do we believe him? He says, I will restore double to you. Is that what God said? Skip on down and let's begin to look at what God will do. Lord, how will you do it? He said, For I will bend Judah as my bow, and I will fill the bow with Ephraim. In other words, I'm going to make you my weapons. I'm going to take you, save you, and turn you into one of my missiles against the devil. I will stir up your sons, O Zion. Zion is a strong church, the overcoming church. Against your sons, O Greece. Greece means Gentiles. It means the enemies of God. Then he says, and I will make you like a what? Warrior's sword. The Bible tells you in Zephaniah, the Lord is the mighty warrior, a victorious warrior. It tells you that in Zephaniah chapter 3. He says, I'm going to make you like my word, a warrior's sword. Does the Bible say the, the, the word of God is sharper and more powerful than any two-edged sword? Does it tell us also in Ephesians 6, you take the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God? He says, I'm going to make you like my word. I'm going to make you like a warrior's sword. Notice, notice what God's doing with us. First, we were in a waterless pit. And we had hope in God. We returned to him. He took us. He restored double to us. And he made us like his word. Then look what he says. And the Lord will blow the trumpet and will march in the south winds of the south. The Lord of hosts will defend them and they will devour and trample on the sling stone. Sling stones? We're going to trample on the sling stones? Lord, what are the sling stones? The sling stones are the missiles that the enemy has been throwing at us, the thought ram. Did he say we'll trample over serpents and scorpions and nothing by any man shall hurt us? Yes. And they will drink where you're drinking from, the river, and be boisterous as with wine, and they shall be filled like a sacrificial basin, drenched like the corners of the altar. In other words, God says, you come to me and mean business, I'm going to soak you so much, you're going to be soaked, waterlogged in the river of life. I've been saying, Lord, drench me, soak me, drown me in that river. Amen? And the Lord their God will save them in that day, 
as the flock of his people. That's what it would be called jewels. Here it is again, folks. Look. For they are as the stones of a crown, sparkling in his, hand, in his land. For what comeliness, that means goodness, and beauty will be theirs. That's the beauty of holiness. Grain will make the young men flourish and new wine the virgins. Can you say amen to that? Amen. You'll never forget this river, will you, folks? Let's go back to Revelation 22, please. You ought to get these tapes of Revelation and send them to your family members as Christmas presents. And I don't celebrate Christmas. Or listen to me. <laughs> Learn to fight with everything you got. Amen? Amen? Revelation 22, he said, He showed me a river of the water of life, clear as crystal. Coming from the throne of God and of the Lamb. Glory to God. Then it says, in the middle of his streets, and on either side of the river, was a tree of life, bearing 12 kinds of fruit. Can I tell you, that's the fruit of the Spirit. You go to that tree and you say, Lord, I don't have love. Lord, I need some fruit from that tree of life. He says, eat from my branches. Follow what God is saying to you. Lord, I need patience. Eat from my branches. You only get it from him. You see, as long as you got a de deflect in your character, you got a disease, a diseased soul. He says, verse 3, and there shall no longer be any curse, and the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and his bondservant shall serve him. Here we come to the fourth part, and they shall see his what? Face. Now, let me tell you about that river before I go to the verse 4. The river represents the freshness of life in Christ. And we need that freshness every day. The life you lived yesterday, if you haven't gone to the throne today, before the river, you're stale. And you stink in the spirit. You're smelling to God. We have to be washed every day in that river. Amen? Amen? The river is where every need's met. All the trees, for any need, or for any healing, any deliverance. And God says we're to live by that river. And the continuous fresh water from God Live in it, continually flowing. It never stops. And if you plan to be an overcomer and want to spend eternity with, with God, it's impossible for you to live apart from that river. And there are no curses at the river of God. Can you say amen to that? Now we come to verse 4. And they shall see his what? Face. Every time the Bible talks about seeing God's face, what does it represent? It represents transformation, transfiguration. It represents resurrection. It represents maturity, maturing, I should say, and strengthening. Every time the Bible talks about God's face, that's what it represents. And God is a personal God. And everyone that will spend eternity in heaven with him will know God for themselves. They will have a personal work of God's hand upon their character and nature. That's why Jesus said, I'm going to say to many in that day, many. The Bible says a remnant will be saved. That means 90% will spend eternity in hell that say I'm a Christian. Remnant means 10%. Think about it. But he talks about these will all see his face. He's almost said to many, I never knew you. Why? They never saw his face. They never lived at the river. They were too busy playing with their gifts. I have a gift. I read the Bible. The Holy Ghost tells me what it means. That gift won't save me. I don't worship my gift. I worship Jesus. You have a gift. Or listen to me. Gifts don't save us. Signs and wonders and miracles don't save us. Ask the children that was led out of Egypt by Moses. God said in Deuteronomy, he never gave them a heart to know him. And they saw all kinds of signs, all kinds of wonders. And the church has gone mad today running for signs and wonders. Jesus says an adulterous and evil generation, it craves signs and wonders. Another place, he says it seeks signs and wonders. I've quoted Matthew 12 and Matthew 18. Let's look at this face. They shall see his face. And when you see his face, look at the promise. When you see his face, look at verse 5. And there shall no longer be any night. No darkness in your life. And they shall not have neither the other light of a lamp or the, nor the light of the sun. Because the Lord God shall illuminate them. And they shall reign forever and ever. Your reigning is right now on the earth over demon powers, over principalities, over sickness and disease, over all the power of the enemy. Why? We've been raised up with him. We're seated with him in heaven, in heavenly places, on the throne. And every time you see his face, he said, you become illuminated. The darkness in your life is dissipated. It's dispelled. And you begin to reign with him over devils, over darkness, 
over all the power of the enemy. Amen? Amen. Well, let's look at this seeing his face job. I think it's important, don't you? Go to Psalm 17, 15. David talked about it. David knew the key, one of the keys in maturing. This is our part, is to see God's face for ourselves. Amen? How fast this six weeks has gone by, hasn't it? David says in Psalm 17, 15, he talks about when he dies and he wakes up. Folks, a Christian doesn't die. Hear me well. A Christian does not die. He just changes locations. When he dies, he wakes up in the glory. When a Christian dies, he goes to sleep in this world and he wakes up in glory. So David says in Psalm 15, he says, as for me, I shall behold what? Thy face in what? Righteousness. And then we come to this word that says, I will be satisfied in your, with thy likeness. You see that part that says, with thy likeness? That's a poor, very poor translation. What that says in the literal Hebrew is, I shall be satisfied with beholding thy face when I wake. What satisfies us? Looking at Jesus' face. Something happens when you see Jesus' face for yourself. How do I know? Go to 2 Corinthians 3, he'll tell you. 2 Corinthians 3, verse 12. Paul writes here and he says in verse 12, having therefore such a hope, hope is happy anticipation. Is that right? Eager anticipation, expectation. Happy anticipation, eager expectation. Hope, anticipating, expecting, happily, eagerly. He says, having therefore such a hope, we use great boldness in our speech. He says, we're not like Moses. Did Moses have all the gifts, all the power, all the signs and wonders to lead the people out of Egypt? He did. Right? Remember? But it wasn't enough. He said, we're not like Moses, who used to put a veil over his face, that the sons of Israel might not look intently at the end of what was fading away. See, if you study Moses' life, what was happening was this. When he got into the presence of God, his face would radiate the glory of God. He said out of God's presence, the glory started fading, and he didn't want the people to know it, so he put a veil over his face. The glory was fading, and they said, he's got the glory. You keep the glory by staying in his face. We're like the moon. We reflect his glory. The moon gets its light, not of his own, but from the sun. The moon is our testimony. We're the moon. Look what he says. He says, but their minds were hardened for until this very day at the reading of the old covenant, the same veil remains unlifted because it's only removed in Christ. See, there's no veiling in Christ. But to this day, whenever Moses read, a veil lies over their heart, but whenever a man turns to the Lord, the veil's taken away. That hardness, that darkness. Veil means to cover and to conceal. You say, I can't seem to see Jesus. Go to him, turn to him, to let you see him. Amen. Look what he says. That's right, keep coming. Now the Lord is a spirit, and where the spirit of the Lord is, there's what? Liberty. But we all with what? unveiled face beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord what's happening to our lives or being ing word ing words means continuous present tense action or being what transformed the word transformed is the same word as transferred is the same word as transfigured looking at his face we're being transfigured into what the same image which means his character, his likeness, his attributes, his attitudes. From glory, the Lord glory of salvation we first got, to glory, just as from the Lord, the Spirit. Going to the fourth chapter, look at verse 3. How about the folks that can't understand the gospel? He tells you in verse 3, he said, even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are what? Perishing. In whose case? Each person has a case. I have a case. You've got a case. God knows your case. In whose case? The God of this world. Who is the God of this world? Satan. 
has blinded the minds of the unbelieving that they may not see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ who is the image of God. For we do not preach ourselves but Christ Jesus as Lord and ourselves as your bond servants for Jesus sake for God who said light shall shine out of darkness is the one who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God where is it located in the face of Jesus Psalms 24 verse 6 every time you go to the face of Jesus by the way did you know it's the face of Jesus that lights all of heaven And he lets us come and look in his face. How can we escape the judgment of God if we continue to neglect so great a salvation? Psalm 24, verse 6. You ready? The Lord says, Jacob, I what? Love. And Esau, I what? Hate. Here's your dividing line. Jacob clings to God. He clings to the face of Jesus. And God is saying, I'm going to have a whole generation of Jacobs. Here they are, generation. I told you, folks, how can we escape God's judgment if we continue to neglect so great a salvation? Look what it says here. This is the generation of those who seek him. What are they seeking? Who seek thy face. Now the word even is italicized, which means it wasn't there in the original translation. It says, who seek thy face. And then the way it's written in Hebrew, there's long Paul. And it says, Jacob. He transforms Jacob's into Israel's. Which means a man possessed by God or a prince with God. Amen? They seek God's face. Psalm 27. Look at verse 8. Psalm 27, verse 8. When thou didst say, Seek my face, my heart said to thee, Thy face, O Lord, I shall what? I shall seek. Don't miss this. Do not hide thy face from me. Do not turn thy servant away in anger. Thou hast been my help. Do not abandon me nor forsake me, O God of my what? Salvation. Look at Psalms 105. Look at verse 4. Do you think maybe seeking the face of God is important? I said, do you think seeking the face of God is important? Yes. Psalms 105, verse 4. What, what do you get out of his face? I told you earlier, his face represents maturing and strengthening. And I'm not tell you that. Here it is in Psalms 105, verse 4. The Lord says, seek the Lord and his what? Strength. strength. Well, how long do we seek his face? He tells you. Seek his face how long? Continually. Folks, every day when you seek the face of God, you get strength to walk in the world. The time you miss seeking his face and you begin your day, you have no strength that day to walk in the world. Number six, please. Number six. See, who are those people in Revelation 21? They sought the face of Jesus. They continue to drink from the water of life. They continue to eat from the tree of life. Numbers six. Verse 25. What a wonderful book. The Lord make his face shine on you. I've been in many dead churches and they use this for a benediction to close. Just a bunch of words. But God means this. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord lifts up his countenance on you and what does he give you? Peace. He gives you peace. And when the Lord gives you peace, folks, look what it says. So they shall invoke my name. When it talks about his name, it means his nature, his character. On the sons of Israel, and I then will what? I'll bless them. The Bible talks about blessing us. What does he mean? Acts 3.26 says, God bless us by turning each and every one of us from our evil, wicked ways. Isn't that wonderful, folks? Psalm 67, verse 1 and 2, please. Psalm 67, verse 1 and 2. 
We saw that that group in Revelation, <laughs> they see his face. Are you seeing why people get transformed, some of us, and some of us don't? Well, there's no prayer life. There's no transformation. I'm going to tell you again, prayer is a language of the poor. It means you're needy. You have more needs from God. A man that doesn't pray says, I'm rich. He's rich with this world. He's rich with his flesh. Psalm 67, verse 1 and 2. God, be gracious to us and what? Bless us. How does God do it? And cause his face to what? Shine upon us that thy way may be known on the earth, thy salvation among all nations. Is that plain? Look at Psalms 80. Here it talks about his face restores us. Seeking God's face restores us. Seeking God's face saves us. Psalms 80. Notice verse 3. O God, restore us. Notice that. O God, restore us. That's the prayer they're praying. Are you praying for God to restore you? Huh? Look what it says. O God, restore us and cause thy face to what? Shine upon us and we will be what? Saved. Isn't that wonderful? You ever ask God to shine his face on you? Begin to ask him. Look at verse 7. O God of hosts, do what? Restore us and cause thy face to shine upon us and we will be what? Saved. When God says something twice, he means it's established. Is that right? In the mouth of two or three witnesses. There it is again. Verse 19. O Lord God of hosts, restore us, cause thy face to shine upon us, and we shall be what? Saved. There's three times. It means it's doubly established. Right? Look at Psalm 31. Verse 14 through 16. Psalm 31. Verse 14 through verse 16. But as for me, I trust in thee, O Lord. I say, thou art my God. My times are in thy hand. Deliver me from the hand of my enemies and from those who persecute me. How does God do it? Look at verse 16. Make thy face shine upon thy servant. Save me in thy what? Loving kindness. I told you, Satan doesn't stay where there's a presence of God, folks. Look at Psalms 119. And look at verse 135. Psalms 119, verse 135. You did bring your spiritual tennis shoes tonight, didn't you? Amen. We're going for a spiritual stroll all through this Bible, folks, from Genesis to Revelation. Psalms 119, verse 135. You said you want God to give you understanding of his word? To speak to you? He speak, every time you hear God's voice, he's got his face shining on you. Look what it says in Psalms 119, 135. Make thy face shine upon who? Thy servant, and teach me what? Thy statutes. Look at Psalms 11, 7. Psalms 11, 7. That guy shooting dice screaming, come 7 11. Don't know what he's missing, does he, folks? Look at Psalms 11, 7. For the Lord is what? Righteous. He loves what? Righteousness. The upright will what? Behold his face. I'm going to tell you right now, it's impossible for you to become righteous without the face of God on your life. Let me show you what it talks about. Is Jesus your king? Amen. Say, Jesus is my king. Jesus is my king. Go to Proverbs 16. Let me show you what's in the face of the king. You know, there's, there's a, something special in the face of our king. Proverbs 16. Notice verse 15. You got it? Did you bring your paintbrushes and watercolors? Paint this one in. Make one underline this one. Paint in purple. Put in polka dots and checkers. Look what it says here. Verse 15. In the light of a king's face is what? Life. And his favor is like a cloud with the what? That word there is latter rain. Let's go back to Revelation's place, the fifth chapter. Oh, where does time go, folks? We about to we got to close. Revelation twenty two, verse five. Now, folks, I want to show you that what we're looking at is paradise restored. Are you hearing me? We saw in Genesis paradise lost where the tree of life was protected. And now when he died and was resurrected, he gave us a right to the tree of life 
if we accept him. Is that right? Amen. Blessed are those who have washed their robes and love the lamb, that they may have a right to the tree of life. We'll see that in, that, in this very chapter. Just remember that. I was quoting it. I remember where it was. I want you to go for just a moment to the beginning of the Bible, of the book of Revelation. And I want Revelation, the second chapter, because I want you to see the reason these trees are there is because the Garden of Eden, everybody said, where's the Garden of Eden? It's in the spiritual realm. It's at the throne of God. Let me show you. Revelation 2. Look with me, please, at the seventh verse. He that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to who? The churches. To him who overcomes, I will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is located where? In the paradise of God. Do you see that? Or are we looking at a paradise here? All right. Let's pick up the fifth verse. I don't think that I need to continue in this book. Let's just close it on out. This has been a wonderful session. Amen? Amen. The fifth chapter says, very clear, the person in the fourth verse that looks at God's face, something happens to their minds. Your forehead is a symbol for your minds. It's the forehead. When it talks about the mark of the beast or the mind of the beast, it means those that continue to claim to be Christians, they walk in anger, strife, lust, wrath, Rebellion, unforgiveness, hatred, gossip, slander. That's the mind of the beast. Is that right? Yeah. But here it talks about the mind being changed. Look what it says. Revelation 22, 4. And they shall see his face. And his name, that's his nature, his character, his likeness, his attitudes, his thoughts, shall be where? On their foreheads. He talked about those in Ezekiel that cry and sigh. And they are marked on their foreheads. Is that right? Look what it says here. And there shall no longer be any night, no darkness in that life. And they shall not have the need of the light of a lamp or of the light of the sun, because the Lord God shall illuminate them, and they shall reign forever and ever. Why? The light of his face is shining on them. Is that right? And he said to me, these words are faithful, they're true. And the Lord, the God of the spirits of the prophets, sent his angels to show to his bond servants the things which must shortly take place. Here's what Jesus says. He says, and behold, I'm coming quickly. Blessed is he who heeds, that means keeps, the words of the prophecy of this book. And I, John, am the one who heard and saw these things. And when I heard and saw, I fell down to worship at the feet of the angel who showed me these things. I just love this. Because this is a human being that went to heaven. God let a human being escort John around heaven, and he never even knew it was a human being. The word angel means messenger. How do I know it was a human being? He tells you in verse 9. And he said to me, do not do that. I'm going to tell you again. That's why I tell you. Don't worship me. Don't praise me. Don't follow my stinking flesh. Amen? That's what happened here. Verse 9. And he said to me, do not do that. I am a what? Fellow servant of yours and your what? Brethren, the prophet, and of those who heed the words of this book, who do you worship? God. You worship God. He must have been beautiful for John to think he was an angel. And he said to me, do not seal up the words of the prophecy of this book, for the time is near. In Daniel's writing, he was told to seal up the book. In this book, it's never sealed, which means forever, during his reign and his ruling as king, as Lord, as God, as priest, high priest, every promise in this book is ours. Heaven is open to us. The river is ours to bathe in, to eat in, to drink from, to even swim in, to get soaked in. Amen? Amen. Don't seal it up, he says. Don't seal it up. The time's near. But what about the one that wants to keep on doing wrong when he comes out of the truth? Look at verse 11. Let the one who does wrong still do wrong. Let the one who is filthy Still be filthy, but let the one who's righteous still practice righteousness. Let the one who is holy still keep himself holy. Behold, I'm coming quickly, and my reward is with me to render to every man according to what he has done. I'm the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Blessed are those who wash their robes, that they may have the right to the tree of life and may enter by the gates into the city. Don't miss this. The moment, the instant, the hour you got saved, you were washed in his blood. The robe is your life. From that moment, you have an open invitation 
to come and eat from the tree of life. And by the way, we already saw in the 21st chapter, the gates are never closed. There's always an invitation, come. The gates is the authority. It's Jesus. I said to you earlier, there are people that camp outside in the outer court. Remember that? And we already have seen from the scriptures, Revelation 11, I think it is, he said, don't measure the outer court. They're given to destruction. That bunch of people that know the ways of God continue to walk in sin, they're going to be destroyed. Then he says in verse 15, outside are the dogs. Folks, he wasn't talking about French poodles and chihuahuas here. He tells you in Philippians 3 that a dog is a person that has a false circumcision. He looks like a Christian. He acts like a Christian. He talks like a Christian. He knows when he raises his hand. He knows when he says, praise the Lord. He may even talk in tongues, but he's false. God calls every person like that a dog. He says, beware of the false circumcision. Beware of the dogs. Is that what he says? He's outside, that means outside, not in the inner court, not before the river of life, not before the throne of God or the dogs. He calls them the sorcerers. The Bible says all rebellion is as a sin of witchcraft. God says that you are a spiritual witch. If you know the truth and you continue to practice sin, you are a sorcerer. And the immoral persons and the murderers. Every time you gossip, you're murdering someone. And the idolaters. Colossians 3 will tell you what idolatry is. And everyone who loves and practices what? Lying. He says, I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you these things for the churches. I'm the root and offspring of David, the bright morning star. But look at this invitation. And the spirit and the bride says, come. And let the one who hears say, come. In other words, you hear the truth, you go to others and tell them, come. Bring others in. And let the one who is thirsty, come. Nothing stops you from God's glory anymore. He's risen. He's reigning. He's ruling. He's on the throne. He's a man. He's king. He's God. He's high priest. Come, he says. Let the one who wishes take the water of life without cost. Verse 18, I testify to everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book. If anyone adds to them, God shall add to him the plagues which are written in this book. Can you imagine how many books have been written and as commentaries on the book of Revelation? Can you imagine the plagues? Can I tell you why they're plagues? Because they buy a lie, they believe a lie, they become damned, and they reject and they neglect their salvation. They do it. Because they don't believe it. They keep waiting for it to happen in the future. They fulfill what Daniel told us that Satan would do. He said he would change the times and the seasons. Isn't it funny? Every horse church talks about the future and what's happening and what happened back there, but nobody talks about what's happening now. This is for right now. Verse 19. God shall add to you in the place written in his book, and if anyone takes away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part from the tree of life and from the holy city which is written in this book. He who testifies these things says, Yes, I'm coming quickly. Amen, which means so be it. Come, Lord Jesus. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with you all. Amen. Let me close and say it again. How can we escape the judgment of God by neglecting so great a salvation? Father, we thank you for this book. It's the most awesome thing, gift, you've ever given to us. Father, we bless these services and these tapes and these messages. And Father, as a church tonight, say this when we pray, Father, that every human being on the face of this earth that hears these tapes will have a transformation upon their lives, even as we have had upon ours. We thank you for this book. We thank you for the unveiling of this book. We give you the glory. We have nothing. We have nothing.